This is why we have this cottage industry of plaintiff lawyers who are running around suing everybody and their brother, because inevitably it is almost always cheaper, always more sensible to just pay the plaintiff lawyer and then move on. I looked at a study that said we each use about 89 websites a month, so that's about three a day, and there are 380 websites created a minute, and 98 to 99 percent of them are inaccessible. So imagine if the three websites you used each day were inaccessible and took you twice as long to use, or that you couldn't use them at all. That would interfere with every bit of your life. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from a sunny Southern California. I have a legal blog named May It Please the Court and have a book out called The Sled. Before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Clio. Clio's cloud-based practice management software makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. You can try it for free at clio.com. That's C-L-I-O.com. In a highly watched case, Robles versus Domino Pizza LLC, Guillermo Robles, who is blind, filed a lawsuit against Domino's back in 2016 when he tried and failed on two occasions to order a custom pizza from the company's website and mobile app. His attorneys argue that Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which entitles those with disabilities to equally partake in and receive benefits from goods and services from business such as restaurants, applies to the online sales platforms of those companies along with brick-and-mortar locations. Well, in January of 2019, some three years later, the Ninth Circuit of Appeals has ruled in support of Robles' argument. Now Domino's is petitioning the Supreme Court of the United States to hear the case. And Domino's is not alone when it comes to issues with website accessibility from Beyonce to Bernie Sanders. Many sites are also not accessible to individuals living with certain disabilities. So today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we'll discuss website accessibility litigation, how the ADA impacts these cases, the role that Department of Justice regulations may play in the matter, and whether or not Robles versus Domino's will reach the high court. To do that, we've got a great show for you today. Our first guest is attorney Eve Hill, one of the nation's leading disability rights attorneys from the law firm Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. Eve's wide-ranging experience complements the firm's dedication to high-impact disability rights and its advocacy on behalf of individuals with disabilities and their families. Eve is the co-leader of Inclusivity, BGL's strategic consulting group. Welcome to the show, Eve. I'm happy to be here. Great, thank you. And our next guest is attorney Min Vu. She is a partner and ADA Title III team leader at Safe Barth Shaw LLP. Attorney Vu is recognized as a thought leader on ADA Title III issues and is known for her practical and business-friendly approach to litigation, as well as compliance under the law. Welcome to the show, Min. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, Min, let's start with you. If you could give us a little bit of background about the litigation in the uh, Robles versus Domino's case and what started it and what the uh, decisions have been so far. Sure. Um, So basically, um, Robles filed a lawsuit um, in the Central District of California, basically alleging that he could not use the Domino's website with his screen reader. Um, Just very briefly, um, people who are blind uh, use assistive technology, software that actually reads to them what is on the screen. And then that's how they're able to interact with the website through the keyboard. So, you know, the allegation is that Domino's website was essentially not, is or was not constructed to be compatible with this assistive, you know, software, um, and he couldn't use it. And then there was also an allegation that the mobile app uh, also suffers from the same deficiency. Although in the case of the mobile app, um, he would have been using that through a mobile device, and that all mobile devices come with built-in kind of screen reader technology that are, you know, obviously used by blind individuals to um, access mobile apps and mobile sites. So the lawsuit is interesting because in the um, Central District of Court of California, 
Judge uh, Otero um, actually dismissed the case. Um, this is a very unusual move because, frankly, he was the only judge that we're aware of um, that actually applied the doctrine of primary jurisdiction as well as this um, uh, due process kind of principle to basically hold that, you know, businesses cannot be held liable under the ADA uh, for not having an accessible website or mobile app when they really weren't on notice of the fact that they needed to make their websites accessible or mobile apps accessible. So the due process argument is really pretty central to the decision below. There was also some discussion about primary jurisdiction, which relates to a doctrine where, you know, the courts, the federal courts will actually kind of step back and stay a case or dismiss a case when they think that an agency has the, ex- the expertise of an agency is needed to examine an issue before the courts can get into it. Now, at the time, the DOJ, the Justice Department, was still supposedly in the process of working on regulations on public accom- for public accommodations websites. So that argument was a little more compelling at the time. In any event, you know, Robles, uh, lost in, in district court. Uh, he p- appealed it to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit earlier this year reversed and decided that, in fact, the ADA does allow for, you know, a claim uh, based on an accessible website and mobile app and determined that there were no due process concerns uh, with basically holding, you know, Domino's liable for this, even though there are no regulations out there that actually tell you what is an accessible website. So that's the explanation of what's gone on. Great. Thanks. Eve, what's the likelihood this is going to go up on CERT? And if it does, what are the issues that Domino's pushing? Well, I don't have much insight into what the Supreme Court will be interested in. But generally, the Supreme Court takes cases when there's a split among the circuit courts on a particular legal issue. And there's not a split in the circuit courts on the issue that Domino's would raise. They're trying to raise an issue that says courts are split on whether online-only businesses are covered. But Domino's is not an online-only business. You use the website to order a pizza from your particular nearby Domino's, and you pick it up at that Domino's. So that meets even the most restrictive test of the circuit courts so far, the Ninth Circuit, in fact, that requires a nexus between the website and the place of public accommodation in order to cover the website. And so there's a split on another issue that wouldn't that resolving it wouldn't affect this case. There simply isn't a split on whether Domino's website is covered under any circuit. So that would indicate that it would be unusual for the Supreme Court to take it. Has Domino's made the argument that there's reasonable accommodations that are available by just picking up the phone and placing an order for a pizza? Well, the real argument is this is a little different from a reasonable accommodation case. I know that's the term that most people use in the ADA. But for uh, communication accessibility, the ADA standard is effective communication. And Domino's has made the argument in the trial court that they would do the same thing you could do through the website over the phone. But this case was decided at the motion to dismiss stage, so it doesn't take into account defenses or other facts. So Domino's hadn't proven that that phone line was available or that it would do all the things that were available on the on the website, such as special orders and coupons and those kinds of things. So while that's a, they're perfectly free to make that argument in the factual stages, that argument doesn't help them at the motion to dismiss stage. Right. Of course. I mean, if for lawyers who are listening to our podcast, what do they need to do to make their law firm websites accessible under the ADA? Well, it's a challenging question, <laughs> honestly. Um, the problem is that most law firms are not in the business of developing websites. They're going to hire a vendor uh, to actually create that website for them. So, in order to, and I guarantee you that none of the existing contracts say anything about accessibility. They might say compliance with all laws, but that's not really going to help you in this case um, because mine does. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, because you probably did it recently. But if you have, so I mean, the point is, like, of course, in the last several years, if you are now a law firm doing a website, and part of your business is handling these cases, which ours is obviously, and and Eve's too, then. 
Yes, you're going to put in that. I mean, what I would put in is that this website is going to be developed and will conform with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines version 2.0, at least, or 2.1, level AA. Okay, and that's a that's a set of guidelines that has been put out by a private consortium of experts, you know, to kind of address web accessibility. It has a number of requirements, and if you meet those requirements, presumably, hopefully, all of your website will be accessible to people with all manner of disabilities, not just the blind. So that's what I would put in. I guarantee you, your developers will resist you mightily <laughs> when you do that. <laughs> Eve, you have some thoughts about this? Well, actually, more and more developers are getting much less resistant to it. So, yeah, that's exactly right. You make sure the contract requires accessibility. You make sure the vendor knows what they're doing and that they know that the standard for accessibility is WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 level AA. And then you check it, and you can require indemnification if it goes wrong. Right. So that's kind of the wish list. I mean, the other thing, too, is knowing, I mean, I think Eve's point about making sure that you really um, hire somebody that knows what they're doing is really important here. And that's something that we do for our clients. You know, our clients ask us, how do we go about doing this? And one of the things we do is we help them figure out, like, who's the right vendor, ask the questions, really what services are you getting, what are the loopholes, you know, what kind of testing are they going to do? Are, gonna, are they going to do the right testing? Or are they just trying to sell you kind of a quick fix that's really not going to address the problem? So it's a tough I mean, it, look, I don't think, I mean, look, we do defense work, but I completely recognize the importance of web accessibility for, for people with disabilities because so much is obviously online or even online only sometimes. It's just we need to get the business community educated and ramped up and, and the development community um, agreeing to do these things without kicking and screaming, which some of them are, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, and Eve, some of us put up, some lawyers put up videos on their websites. Are they, uh, I think there's a, what, a recent case uh, from 2011, National Association of the Deaf versus Netflix, that they're supposed to be captioned. Does that apply to websites as well? It does. So again, if the video is communicating something, that should be effectively communicated for both people with and without disabilities. And captioning is the way to make those videos accessible for people with hearing disabilities. It's pretty easily done. It's getting easier all the time, actually, to caption a video and make sure it goes up captioned from the beginning. Yeah, that's the that's thing. My, that, my, I mean, man, let me jump in here for a second. My wife is an American Sign Language interpreter, and she has been certified by the California Office of Emergency Services to be an interpreter during those town hall meetings when they tell you about earthquakes and fires and damn mm -hmm. floods and, and the like. <laughs> What requirements are there for ASL interpreters to be on websites? I mean, in addition to captioning a uh, video, do you also have to have a, uh, an American Sign Language interpreter? Interesting question. I think that, okay, so the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines that we were just talking about, WCAG for short, um, there's three levels of accessibility, A, AA, and AAA, and I believe AAA requires sign language. You know, at least so far, um, we have not seen any courts or even the Justice Department demanding triple A yet. And so captioning that kind of goes along with what's going on in the audio is fine at this point. And yes, it is, it is much easier to do that now. What's involved in litigation? I mean, how does the ADA affect litigation? Oh, how does it affect litigation? Do you mean for the lawyers and the litigants? Or right, lawyers, litigants, oh, judges, oh, sure. clerks. How does, the, how does the whole operate inside the courthouse? Well, courts have obligations to accommodate and provide effective communication for people with disabilities who are interacting with the courts, including lawyers who are blind or deaf, jurors who are blind or deaf, judges, and any other participant in the proceeding who's blind or deaf. So they are capable and, and are required to provide sign language interpretation, uh, accessible documents, effective communication through their websites, forms, and so forth. Similarly, lawyers are covered under Title III of the ADA and have an effective communication obligation. So if a lawyer is meeting with a client or prospective client or uh, opposing counsel or opposing party, uh, they also need to be prepared to provide accessible electronic documents, Braille documents if those are needed, and interpretation and other accommodations uh, such as 
letting the service animal into the office and so forth. So those obligations have been around for 29 years now, and we're getting better at them, I must say. (laughs) Well, thank you. And we have to take a quick interruption here before we move on to our next segment. We're going to take a break to hear a message from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With intuitive time tracking, billing, and matter management, Clio streamlines everything you do to run your practice from intake to invoice. Try Clio for free and get a 10% discount for your first six months when you sign up at their website, clio.com, that's C-L-I-O.com, with the code L2L10, that's L2L, the number 10. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm Craig Williams, and with us today is disability rights attorney Eve Hill from the law firm of Brown, Goldstein, and Levy, and attorney Min Vu, partner in ADA Title III team leader at Safarth Shaw LLP. Well, we've been listening to some of the requirements that uh, Eve and, and Min have spelled out about the websites that lawyers and, and courthouses need to have. Min, you mentioned that you had some resources available. Where do attorneys turn to to get these resources to get their websites in the right type of position? I, I admittedly don't think I could produce a set of Braille documents if I were required to. How would we go about doing that? Well, if you, I mean, look, well, if you have a case that you need to have, you know, hire counsel for, or if you just want to comply, you know, start complying with the law. Um, you know, you need to talk to an attorney who obviously specializes in this area. It's a very niche little area. Uh, I will say that. Very few attorneys actually operating in this space, relatively speaking. And then that attorney would, um, you know, have a list of trusted consultants um, and firms that, you know, they know can kind of deliver the right services. It's challenging. It's not like there's a list of certified there's not really a list of certified consultants out there where you can just go and, and, you know, hire somebody and know that they've been properly vetted. So unfortunately it's very much um, word of mouth and, you know, you never quite know for sure whether you've hired the right consultant without kind of the guidance of counsel. Now, probably they're also in, on the plaintiff side, I think there are probably organizations like the National Federation of the Blind and, and others who have views about who the right consultants are as well and they could probably provide resources. That's right. I think both the American Foundation for the Blind, the National Federation of the Blind, and the American Council of the Blind have folks, experts whose work they've seen and think is is adequate. There are more of these accessibility consultants coming into the field more and more these days, and so you do have to watch out for fly-by-nights. There are a set of questions you can ask them, First thing, do they know what standard to apply? Second, how do they test? You want to hear that they don't just rely on automated testing, that they use actual user testing. You want to talk to some of their other clients. You want to know how their um, developers or how their testers have been trained. There are a variety of those questions that you can ask just to reassure yourself that they have qualifications and are qualified to do the work. Well, we have these web guidelines that are out there, as you mentioned, men from a private organization, but apparently no DOJ regulations. So is this just a Wild West, or how do we know what the standards are? Um, so it's a tough question. I mean, I think there are, if you just wanted to make your website accessible, I think most professionals in the space would point you to the web content accessibility guidelines, the standards that I just mentioned. Now, you know, if we were in litigation, do I think that that would be the standard that the court would use to assess whether a website is accessible or not? I, I don't actually think that's the standard because, precisely as you said, there are no regulations that say these are the standards you must meet. Okay. Ultimately, the standard under Title III, the ADA, is you know, can this plaintiff with a disability um, access all the goods and services that you're offering to people who aren't disabled? on the website. So the question is much more, is more practical and functional. Now, obviously, if your website complied with the WCAG, then chances are the answer is going to be yes. But um, the WCAG also covers, remember, many different disabilities. If you have a blind plaintiff, then only the issues that relate to the blind would be at issue in that case, because the plaintiff would only have standing for blind issues. So like I said, it is confusing out there. I think we get a lot of calls from businesses who uh, that just really need guidance and don't really kind of understand, like, what's the standard? What should I be doing? 
you know, how would we litigate this case? I mean, it's, it's, it's confusing. You know, it's understandable to make a complaint about Domino's because it's a widely known nationwide business. But what, what do you do with the mom and pop uh, businesses. I mean, most of the websites across the country advertise a small business, and uh, certainly it would be, I'm sure, quite burdensome cost-wise to have every uh, website be accessible like that. And, you know, I'm thinking, how are the courts going to react to this? Are they going to react to it in the same way that they did with respect to the plaintiff's cases that came in on accessibility in, in small businesses and restaurants? Eve, what's your thought about that process? Well, I actually, if you build your website accessibly to begin with, it doesn't really add cost. So that's the key there is for small businesses to insist that their vendors or the templates that they use are built to be accessible. When you do that, it doesn't really add cost. The things that are expensive are to go back and remediate things that are inaccessible. So I think it's very important that the developers of websites and the people who provide the templates for websites make sure that those templates are both accessible and that they prompt people who are putting in content to make sure that they've tagged the images so they can, those images can be described, that they've labeled the buttons and forms and do those relatively simple things. But those templates do need to do some work and, and get themselves made accessible so that they don't put this burden of remediation on small businesses. And that's where our big problem lies. Well, I mean, there was a case, I think, just a couple of years ago, Juan Carlos Gill versus Win dixie stores that uh, held the grocery chain websites have to be accessible. Is there a, a line in terms of the size of a website that has to be, that falls within this? I mean, is it like, does the ADA apply to every single website or does it apply to some and not others? So I think technically it would apply to all websites. The difference and in, in what you would want to argue if you were a small business is that perhaps having an, access, an accessible website um, imposes an undue burden okay, on your business. Because what the ADA does is it really doesn't differentiate between big business and small business. It says, okay, listen, the standard is you're, you're, gonna, you're required to ensure effective communication with um, people with disabilities. And that's the rule. Okay? The defenses are um, you may not have to do that if it imposes an undue burden or it fundamentally alters the goods or services that you're providing. All right, fundamental alteration is really not an issue um, for websites. So if you're truly a tiny business or you're losing money every year, or you know, you just, you know, if you're in that position, you might be able to argue undue burden. The problem, the real practical problem here is if you get sued, you're a small business, okay, and somebody's asking, demanding $5,000 out of you to resolve this case. You're faced with either paying that $5,000 or litigating the case, okay? And, and undue burden is one of those issues that will never get resolved early on. It's, a, it's basically a factual issue that's going to have to go all the way to trial. So you are going to spend way, way more than $5,000 to go through to the bitter end, and you may or may not win, <laughs> okay? So mm -hmm. the pra that, this is why we have this cottage industry of plaintiff's lawyers who are running around suing everybody and their brother, because inevitably it is almost always cheaper always more uh, more sensible to just pay the plaintiff's lawyer and then move on. Okay, that's it. Because litigating, even if you have a decent defense, is going to be, you know, at least 10 times more expensive, if not more. And we've had that same problem here in California on, on Prop 65 litigation. And the attorney general's put his foot down and said that, you know, you can pretty much only sue once. But if you settle with one plaintiff's lawyer, what's the guarantee you're not going to get another plaintiff's lawyer two weeks from now? That's exactly the problem. I mean, <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think this is Eve, you know, I similarly have problems with, with plaintiff's lawyers who file and just demand a quick payment without making the website accessible. The point of a civil rights law is to stop the civil rights violations, not just to pay out small bits of money to make someone go away. And particularly when those settlements are confidential and therefore we can't tell whether the fix has been, is going to be made or not. That leaves everyone in the dark and I think really does a disservice. Hopefully the federal system would have some, you know, it has a pretty good vexatious litigant system and presumably can track those kinds of things. And I know our California state bar has also put its foot down in these types of recurrent litigation by, you know, 
one lawyer will file 50 or 60 lawsuits on behalf of a single plaintiff and you know get the five thousand dollars on these little small ada access cases to to restaurants and the like but well let's let's take a look at it from the other perspective i mean you know legitimately people have disabilities and can't use these websites for those people eve where do they go to get relief i mean do they come which whose law firm do they seek out where do they get this kind of help and and what are the resources for people that can't use websites and and don't have this under the ada yeah um, you need to picture, so apparently I looked at a study that said we each use about 89 websites a month, so that's about three a day, and there are 380 websites created a minute, and 98 to 99% of them are inaccessible. So imagine if the three websites you used each day were inaccessible and took you twice as long to use or that you couldn't use them at all. That would interfere with every bit of your life. So, but what people do and what they should do is look for a lawyer with experience that will show you what settlements they've done and will show you also that they're prepared to take the case to litigation. So I recommend that potential plaintiffs who feel they've been discriminated against by an inaccessible website or really any inaccessibility go to a lawyer who can say, here are the cases that I've litigated, here's the summary judgments that I've been through, here are the motions to dismiss that I've been through, here are the results that I've gotten. And if the results are, well, the websites are still inaccessible, but I got the client $5,000 or I got myself $5,000, that's not the lawyer you want because you want someone who will actually pursue the case to fix the problem. Great. Thank you. Well, it looks like we just about reached the end of our program, so I'd like to take the opportunity for both of our guests to share their final thoughts and their contact information. And Eve, let's let you finish that up. Sure. Um, I think with the world going online at an alarming rate, people with disabilities were already having had difficulty getting to and using the physical spaces of stores. And the online movement should have been a huge benefit to them because now you don't have to face the transportation issues and the physical accessibility issues. And websites are, are just zeros and ones. You can put them in any format. They can be tactile. They can be audible. They can be captioned. They can. I'm sure we're aiming for scratch and sniff one of these days. So those zeros and ones could easily be translated into accessible formats. People with disabilities already bring their own assistive technology to access those accessible formats. They're just asking that we, they get met halfway so that they can have the same benefits that everyone else does from going online and not be left further behind in the digital world. And I can be reached at ehill at browngold.com, and you can look us up at browngold.com. Great. Thank you, Eve. And Min, let's give you the same opportunity, your final thoughts and contact information, please. Sure. Well, I think businesses are in a very difficult place right now, um, given the amount of litigation that is going on. And, you know, they're facing this on a daily basis. What I'm hoping is that um, we get congressional action or DOJ action um, to actually set you know, set the rules for what is an accessible website, what's an accessible mobile app, and a sensible transition period so that basically businesses can get their house in order once we know exactly what the rules are. And then I think there needs to be a safe harbor. You know, I mean, essentially, websites are changing on a daily basis because they get updated all the time. Things break. We all know that. And so companies that are doing the right thing and have proper auditing procedures and ways to monitor those folks, there should be a safe harbor for the occasional problem. Um, you know, if you screw up, you know, and fix it, there, it should be okay um, if you have the right procedures in place. Small businesses, they need different rules, frankly. They probably need more time to get it together um, because they are entirely dependent on third parties to get it right. Um, they have zero bargaining power, okay, in the terms of, uh, you know, getting their uh, websites accessible. So, again, having a law or regulations that say, here's how accessible websites need to be built, will then send a message to the vendors that they are required to do that, as opposed to the current state today, where they're not. I mean, they're not liable. They can't be sued. It's the businesses that are getting sued. So, anyway, um, our contact information, my contact information is... M is in Mary, V is in Victor, U is in Unicorn at Cypharth.com. Cypharth is S E Y F as in Frank A R T H. 
Great. Well, thank you both very much. We'd like to thank Eve Hill and Min Vu for being our guests today. It was been an excellent discussion about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, if you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com, where you can leave a comment on today's show and sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Please join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi for their next podcast, covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Consult a lawyer.